my sin is gone, and I can begin a new life free from sin and true death. This is only the beginning. Because of who Jesus is and what he's done for me, I choose to follow him. My outward self is washed as a display of my inward faith. I eagerly give him my obedience, declaring this gift to the world. God refuses to leave me scarred by sin. His desire is for me to have the humility, kindness, and love of Jesus. To fight the temptation, pride, and laziness of my old self. Knowing this world is still broken, I cling to the hope that is coming. future with Jesus brings me great joy. This is what God has done. I deserve death. Jesus died in my place. I am made clean. In obedience, I follow him. I grow in faith. And my future hope brings new life. This is amazing grace. This is the gospel. Well, once again, we want to welcome you this morning, Smith Street Baptist Church, and online at uh, smithstreetbaptistchurch.org and on the app. We're glad you could be with us this morning, whether in person or by way of technology. Let us stand this morning, and as you do, turn over to Revelation 1, chapter 9, last book of your Bible, I mean, uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. It's the last book of your Bible. I'm going to try a couple things different this morning. We'll see how good I do. I may not get any of them right, but I'm going to try to uh, speak slower and speak shorter. We'll see. Now, nobody's complained, so that's actually a good thing. See, if you complained, I I would keep speaking fast. And I would keep uh, going long. So because you haven't complained, I thought I'd bring a gift this morning, 1st of October, and welcome you uh, with this present, this offering. We'll see how that goes, though. So if you don't get the gift, don't feel too bad. Because I know that most of us are probably not holding out any hope that either one of those are actually going to happen. Revelation 1, chapter 9 through 20. This is what it reads. I, John, your brother, and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom of perseverance, which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos, because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice, like the sound of a trumpet, saying, Write in a book what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see that that which was speaking to me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, And in the middle of the lampstands I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword." And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. Therefore, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and as we ask every week, may it speak to us through your spirit, make it clear that we might know you in a right relationship of forgiveness through Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing this morning in the honor of reading God's Word. Well, as John continues here in the book of Revelation and continues to see his vision and we get to unpack this vision, uh, he's told of the lampstands which signify the churches. Now, oftentimes during persecution, 
Followers may ask themselves or ask others, where is God? Or even, is God aware of our circumstances? Many times, uh, situations of health or tragedy or problems or disagreements may come about and we may find ourselves asking that very question, saying, God, where are you? Or why did this happen to me? Or why did this happen to someone else? Uh, and, and, and right now the people of Puerto Rico may be asking that very question. We are continuing here in America to go along with our lives, uh, while many in Florida and, and Houston and Puerto Rico are, are, have lives have changed forever. Uh, we get caught up in our personal stuff. We get caught up in whether or not we're going to have enough money to eat out this week, or whether we're going to be able to go to the game this Friday or this Saturday or Sunday, or even whether people are going to kneel or not. And when we get into all these things... And while some of these issues are important and some of them may have their place, uh, compared to what the Puerto Ricans are going through right now, uh, it's nothing in comparison. It's nothing at all to have your home and your livelihood devastated and destroyed. Since the storm, people have been living outside. Can you imagine staying outside unprepared for one night, much less for weeks at a time, which may turn into months and may turn into years, uh, depending on in some of the most rural and most... um, poorly populated parts of the, uh, of the island. It is a, it's a sad situation, nevertheless. It is a real situation, and, and this kind of situation goes on and on and on, and, and people will sometimes misunderstand me, and they'll say, well, I know I've got a lot going on, but it's not as bad as what somebody else has going on. And while that's true, too, I often correct them and say, yeah, but what you have going on in your life is still what you have going on in your life. It's important to you because it's happening to you. So I know that in spite of the fact that we compare our struggles with someone like uh, something like Puerto Rico, and in comparison, our struggles don't seem to be as bad or they're not as bad, we still, when we pull back and look, we still have our struggles. We still have our own issues. We still have our own things. And no matter how many times a preacher or anybody says, "Don't, don't fall into the trap of comparing yourself to other people, Oh, excuse me. No matter how many times we say this that I just said about comparing yourselves to other people, what we tend to do is go back and get into our own lives, and those problems come up and they're in front of us. In other words, whatever's in front of us is really what we're going to focus on. Now, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm not trying to say that your problems aren't important. What I'm trying to say is, in spite of that, all those people, us, them, everybody, who has problems, can find ourselves in a place that the early Christians found themselves in. And that's a place of saying, where are you, God? Where are you, God? Why aren't you here? Why haven't you healed me? Why haven't you mended this relationship? Why are you letting innocent good people suffer and bad people flourish? Why, God, are you allowing these things to happen in our state, in our country, and in this world? You're the king of kings. You're the ruler of everything. And we, can, we forget sometimes that we fall, live in a fallen world, that the ruler of the world, of the earth, temporarily is the enemy, Satan, not God. God is the ruler of everything, but he has cast the devil down and given him, uh, uh, allowed him to have authority over this planet. And for all those who won't follow Christ, his authority remains. But for those who will follow Christ, those who do follow Christ, those who give their lives to Christ and accept Him as Lord and Savior, the devil doesn't have that authority over us anymore. He doesn't have that dominion over us that he has over the lost, although we will still be affected by the fact that we live in a fallen world. So if you're with me on that, then it makes sense to say that sometimes we find ourselves in that place of despair where we say we cry out in some way, whether it's verbal or or we think it or we just feel it, We cry out and we say, God, why me? And oftentimes, I would dare say, we don't really hear anything back. But there's some answers that the Spirit can bring to us through His Word. And the answers that come to us are found in Revelation 1, 9 through 20. So I want to ask you this question. And then I want you to just consider it till the end. I'm not going to give you the answer till the end. But have you ever felt this way? When I say I'm not going to give you the answer, I'm not going to tell you what God's word says in conclusion until we get to the end. That's where the conclusion is. But have you ever felt this way? Just this week. I don't know if there's not a day, a week goes by, I don't find myself, even in my own little selfishness, find myself saying, why me about something? About something. 90% of the time, it's why me about pain. But, but why me about something? 
And so I think we can all understand that. So just keep in mind, have you ever felt that way? Have you ever said, why me? Well, when we, sorry, when we write or read Revelation 1, 9 through 11, or 9 through 20, we start with 1, 9 through 11, which is in your bulletin, and the blank is the setting. So the setting is where we begin here. And the setting is this. <clears throat> I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation, or some uh, may say your companion in the suffering and perseverance, which are Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now, the setting is the island of Patmos. Now, sometimes when you think about going to an island, you might think, well, that, you know, I'm going to the tropical island. I'm going to a nice island, an island paradise, you know, with the coconut trees and the nice cool breeze and the ocean lapping on the, on the beach. And, and I don't know how many of you picture an island like that, but if you came to me and said, would you like to go on an island vacation with us? I'd say, well, yes. And I probably wouldn't ask you what kind of island it was. I would just assume that you had some sense about you and you were going to go to a nice, tropical, beautiful place, you know, where they served you uh, Coke Zero in a glass with a little... Umbrella, isn't that what they're drinking? That's not what they're, well, that's what I would be drinking, is a little Coke Zero in a glass, or maybe some Diet Mountain Dew if they had that over there. So that's, that's, that's what we envision when we say island or the tropics. Uh, Patmos was not that kind of place. Patmos was not a great place to be. In fact, it was one of three islands in the area that Rome would exile those who were in uh, uh, conflict with Rome. Sometimes death was something that would happen, but oftentimes, and in John's case, they were the emperor would just have you exiled. So the emperor, uh, Dom, Domitian, the emperor at the time, he sends uh, John over to Patmos to be exiled, and it's there where John is alone in on the island of Patmos by himself, kind of secluded in exile, that he receives this vision from God. I think it's interesting that now. Let me be clear before I say it. The vision that God gave John in Revelation is the last vision of things to come. If somebody comes up and says, hey, I got a vision from God and it's a prophecy and this is what's going to happen, they are, by standards of Scripture, called a false prophet. I just, I'm sorry, that's what they are. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't have a dream and from your dream, maybe you hear something or, or see something in your dream that helps, make, helps you make a decision that's a better decision than what you might have made. In other words, maybe you go to... Bed. Some people will say it's just the days of, of uh, your experience of the day kind of coming out in a dream. Uh, other people will say God is speaking to you through the dreams. Uh, I, you know, it could be one or the other. It could be a combination of both. I will tell you this. You'll think I'm making it up, but I've tested it, and it's true. If you eat cheese before you go to bed, you'll dream. I guarantee you, go try it. Who said it's true? I heard somebody whisper. Somebody said it's true. Yeah. Have you tried that before, Sterling? See, Sterling knows. Sterling, that's scary that you and I are on the same page there, but <laughs> scary for you, not for me, scary for you. Um, but I heard that one day, and uh, so I did, I tried it. I took four pieces of sliced cheese and ate them, I don't dream often, and ate them that night, and I had a dream. I don't remember what the dream was, but I had a dream that night. And so I've done it more than once, and every time, never fail, I have some kind of odd, strange dream that I remember when I wake up from the cheese. Now, why is that? I don't know. I didn't go and investigate the science behind it. Do I think God is speaking to me through craft? No. I don't think God's speaking to me through our cheese. But what I know is that there's a lot of stuff happens that I don't know, right? And don't understand, including this. And I know some of y'all are going to go home and try it, and I encourage you to do so. And I would love to hear your stories. Or maybe not. Some of you might have dreams you don't want to share. I don't know. It's, God, God hey, works in amazing, uh, strange ways, right? Mysterious ways, right? So the cheese story for the day leads us into understanding that lots of stuff happens that we don't know. But here's the thing. Scripture says lots of things happen that we can't understand or can't explain. But here's the thing. Scripture says that we're not going to have any more visions of this. It's completed at the end of Revelation. I tell you that because a lot of um, what we would call cults have come out of visions from God in the, in the history. In history. Um, it, no offense to you if you are or have been part of some of them, but the fact uh, is, and the truth is, uh, if it's not in Scripture and, and it contradicts Scripture, it's not of God. And so, not if it's not in Scripture, but if it contradicts Scripture. There's plenty of things that God does that may not be there. We don't know everything from Scripture. But we know if it contradicts Scripture, it's not in, from God. So, understand that the vision that John has given here, 
that's been given is the last one to have been given for the purposes of the kingdom. Now, that being said, the reason I mention that is because I was going to say, it's interesting that John receives the vision while in exile, alone, probably spending a lot of time with God, praying and thinking about things and studying and reading. He's, he's, he's in exile. Imagine for just a second, if you took the busyness of the world and pulled it away from you and you went into exile for a period of time. Now, are, are, am I saying you'd receive a vision? No, that's why I said what I said about the visions. But can you, by the Holy Spirit, receive direction? Absolutely. The Holy Spirit is our comforter and our counselor and our guide, and He directs us and guides us along in, in, in accordance with the Scriptures. Here's what I'm saying. Here's what I'm getting at. The more time we spend alone with God, the better we can discern what He's telling us to do through the Holy Spirit. The more time we spend alone in His Word, the better prepared we are for the days and weeks to come. It's important that we understand that. Because for many of us, Sunday morning is our only time in the Word of God. Sunday morning, maybe a Wednesday night, maybe a Bible study once a month or twice a month, but that's it. We're not in God's Word on our own. We're not in our prayer closets. We're not in our war rooms. We're not spending time with God, crying out to God about what we see happening in our life, what we see happening in our spiritual walk as it deteriorates. We want more of God, not less of God. Instead of saying, God, I want more of you and less of me, we tend to act like we want less of God and more of us. And so that's the message there. Stay or get into exile with God. In other words, shut out the rest of the stuff. Shut out the rest of the stuff. I believe sometimes, I don't know if this is true, I just, it's just a thought, that when I receive, uh, when I experience high levels of pain, I find myself in exile. I know that to be true. And this is what I mean. When I find, when I start hurting bad enough to stay home, I spent all day Wednesday in bed, sleeping most of it. I spent all day Thursday in bed, awake all of it. I didn't sleep one wink all day Wednesday. And, I mean Thursday. And yet, I was in exile. And here's what I mean by that. From Wednesday through Friday with the exception of a couple hours in the morning. I was in exile. My wife wasn't there. My kids weren't there. Y'all weren't there. Nobody was there. Nobody nobody knocked on the door. And I'm not saying you should have. I mean, I like to be in exile when I'm not hurting, so don't misunderstand that statement. But nobody was coming by. Nobody was knocking on the door. Nobody was bothering me. And if you did call or text, I didn't answer the phone because I like being in exile when I'm hurting. I just want to be left alone because I'm not in the best of moods. Anybody get an amen there, right? So sometimes you just want to be left alone when you're recovering, right? So, in those times, however, it's always those times that I, that I pray more, and that I think on God more, and that I listen for God more. It's always those times. Because I'm in exile of the rest of the world. There's not that hustle and bustle, and, and the idea that things can't go on without me, that goes, falls by the wayside because I realize things are going to go on without me. If I were plucked out of this world today, guess what? You wouldn't cease to exist tomorrow. You would continue to go on about your daily routines. It might be affected for a little while, but then eventually you'd go back to life. And that's exactly the reminder when I'm in exile is that it's not Chester doing these things, it's God doing these things. So that's kind of what I get from it. And then I'm like, okay, God, I'm going to rest and feel better. When we spend more time in exile we have a better chance of hearing from God. Now, does that mean you should go into Mark, quit your jobs, and run off to an island? Well, if that's what you want to do. But I'm not telling you to do that. And I would encourage you to pick somewhere other than Patmos if you're going to do that. But that being said, John was exiled. He was on the island of Patmos. And it was no vacation for him. It was no vacation, as the next blank says. He was suffering. This was a time where he was suffering. And he received, he was in a weak state, in his weakest states, and he receives the revelation from Jesus Christ. Now, Revelation 1, 12. Oh, I, I missed this, and I, I probably should have said this, and guys, I got ahead of you, and I skipped it, and I apologize. John was a brother and a companion in the suffering with fellow churches. That's a point that I want to make. That's your first, uh, second blank under part one. I want to make that point because 
John was a brother in Christ who was also suffering in exile. Just like the churches were suffering persecution of this time period. Just like in some ways in America we're suffering persecution and in some very drastic and harsh and terrible ways in the world the church is suffering persecution. The church is still suffering persecution today. Depending on where you are it changes the level of persecution but we still experience it. And what John was saying here is I'm part of that. I'm a companion with you. I'm a partaker with you in the suffering. All right. So I want to make that point clear as we go in to the next part of this verse or this next section, Revelation 1, 12 through 16. In Revelation 12, 1 through 16, the vision in, in what I say, 12, 1 through 16, I'm sorry. In Revelation 1, 12 through 16, the vision of the Son of Man is what we call this. The vision of the Son of Man. He says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Now, the voice that Jesus heard here was who? It was Jesus. This is the revelation of Jesus. It was the revelation of Jesus to John. So it was Jesus' voice that he hears, and he turns and he sees the seven golden lampstands. Now, it's interesting, the imagery that is used, because it's beautiful, it's pretty, it may have been literal, he may have actually seen that, but it can be very easy to get confused. And usually people will stop reading Revelation about this point with any deep understanding because all of a sudden there's a bunch of stuff that they don't get. Let me explain something. The lampstands, whether figurative or literal, they mean the seven churches that Jesus is giving this vision to. We read those churches earlier. They were Ephesus and Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. He's, he's giving those churches orders and responsibilities and telling them something very specific dealing with their existence and the end times and we have an application for that that we'll get to as we go through each one of those churches starting next week now the lampstands re representing the seven churches some have called that uh, tied that into the menorah with the middle one being jesus and the menorah if you remember uh, if you know what a menorah is the jewish lamp they light during hanukkah uh, each one of those may have been like that. It may have been that way. It also may have been, some argue, that it may have been seven individual lampstands. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether it was one menorah with the seven stands, six on each side, seven in the middle, or if it was seven individual lampstands. That's not important. What's important is that you recognize, and you hold on to this, that each lampstand represented the church. Each lampstand represented a church. Now, let's talk for just a second about a lampstand. What does a lampstand do? Well, a lampstand holds a lamp. This is a music stand. What does a music stand do? Well, it's Mystery Baptist Church. It does a lot of things. It holds a lot of things. But typically, it was created to hold music. Whether it be the music of a choir, whether it be the music of the band, whether it be the music of... The conductor, it is there to hold music so that they have something to hold their music and their hands can be free for whatever else they might need to be used for. In this case, a lampstand, let me, let me take it one step further, not that you need it, but let me take it one step further, as a candle stand or a candle stick. The candle stand. Now why is this important? Because <clears throat> this is simply the stand of the candle. It absolutely serves very little purpose by itself. It is not a good idea to spend, although people do, millions of dollars on one of these because it is literally a stand. It is just a piece of junk. Not necessarily this one. This one's great. But it is probably donated or something. But it is a piece of junk used to hold something. Now, I'm not saying that we are a piece of junk, but... The churches are the lampstands. Now this is where our arrogance gets into things a little bit. Our pride. Because we're the church and we should do everything the way we want to do it. And blah, 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 blah. And then we miss our vision and we miss our point. What's the purpose of this? The purpose of this is to hold this. See, you can spend a lot of money on nice, beautiful little wax candles. Some of the candles burn different colors. 
Some of them, when the wax drips down, it changes the colors. Some of them are nice. Some of them are scented. Some of them are pretty. Some of them are not. Some of them are long. Some of them are short. Amazing the opportunities that you have from a bunch of wax that's been hardened with a little wick in the middle that burns forever and ever until it runs out. It's also exciting to know that when the power goes out and the electric companies fail you, a little bit of fire on the end of this will give you a little bit of light, right? It will help light your path. Now, all of a sudden, this little candlestick or this stand... I know, now it's going to be leaning for the rest of the time we use it. It is now serving a much greater purpose. Why? Because this wouldn't go very far. Holding it in my hand lit would not go very far at all. In fact, up until the wax begins to drip, that's about all the light I'm going to get. Then I'm going to burn the place down when I drop it to the floor. So, I need something to help. The other thing is, when I place it on the table... Well, that was real good. Here, everybody, let's have everybody over for dinner. Heather, let's have everybody over for dinner tonight. Here, honey, light the candle. I'll hold it. Okay, now I'm going to do well. There you go. So you have the candlestick. Now, why am I making such a big deal about that? I'll tell you why. Because when it comes to the lampstand, the job of the lampstand is to hold the light. When it comes to the church, the job of the church is to hold the light, which is Jesus Christ. That's our job out there. We are the church, we are the ambassadors of Jesus Christ and His message for the world. And it is our job to let our light shine before men, the light we're responsible for and the light through us, shine before men out there in the world so that they will see our good deeds and not praise us, but praise our Father in heaven. How many of you are guilty? Don't answer this out loud. Are y'all cold, by the way? I am. <laughs> feel like I need to put on another jacket or something. I don't know why 45 is not cold. <laughs> All right. I see some of y'all bundling up saying, Lord, I wish he'd hurry up. I'm about to freeze. And I started thinking, my hands are about to fall off. Um, I have no idea where I was, but you know. Oh, how many of you are... Guilty, again, don't answer this, but how many of you are guilty of as a representative or an ambassador of Jesus Christ going out into the world and snuffing out the light of Christ? See, it's very easy for us if I had a lighter, and don't give me one if you do, we'll just pretend, but if I had a lighter and I, I lit that candle, it would be very easy for me to lick my fingers and tss, touch the edge of it, and it probably wouldn't hurt all that much, or not even at all, as I snuff out that little flame. Well, the light of Christ cannot be snuffed out eternally, we know that, but people are going to see us as we go out into the world, and they either need to see Jesus in us, the light of Christ in us, or they're going to see us. And if they see us, they're going to see a tarnished, ugly old lampstand that's not doing anything for the, for the glory of God. But if they see the light, they're going to see Jesus. We don't want people to see us. We don't want people to see us. We want people to see Christ and his work in us. Let me say that again. We don't want people to see us. We want people to see, his, see Christ and his work in us. When you do something good for somebody, it's not for your glory. And don't do it if it is. It's for the glory of God, right? So John, here's Jesus, sees the lamp stands, and we know that the lamp stands represent the seven churches. Let me continue to read here as we talk about the image of Jesus for just a second. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has become made to glow in a furnace. His voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun, shining in its strength. Man, what reaction would you have if that was you and you saw that, if you were standing there as John and you saw that, your reaction would be what? Well, it probably would be like John's. Probably would have been like John's. And what was John's reaction? He fell down on his face like a dead man. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, verse 17 says. And he placed his right hand on me and he said, oh, and I love this because he says this all the time. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. So falling down shows how overwhelmed John was in his sight. There's that song came out about 10 years ago or so. 
uh, I can only imagine by mercy me. And it talks about what would it be like if I was standing there in the presence of God. Can I tell you something, believers? You will stand in the presence of God. Uh, I do believe so will the non-believers for a while. There's a time that every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. So understand something. We will have that opportunity. And we have forgotten, and we'll see this in a, in a, in a week or so, we have forgotten what it is like to be in the presence of God Almighty. Now some of you will say, you'll argue theologically, well, we're not in the presence of God like we will be then. No, you're right, we're not. But we have forgotten our first love. We have forgotten our salvation moment. We have forgotten that time where we cried tears or laughed joyfully or we were so excited about having been plucked from hell and the future of hell and, and placed in the future of heaven that we told everybody we could imagine. Being saved was a great thing. We've forgotten about that. We've let that go. We've gone into, what do we do? We've come out of exile. And we've surrounded ourselves with work and money and jobs and responsibilities and family and children and TV and radio. And, and, we've, and, and none of those things are inherently bad by themselves. But we've taken all that stuff and we've piled so much of it onto us that now... If we have time for Jesus, great. And if we don't, we'll have to try next week. And that's become the church's attitude. John was overwhelmed to the point of falling down on his face. And Jesus, I love Jesus and what he says. He says, do not be afraid. You know, the angel said that in, when Jesus was born to the, to the shepherds in the field. Remember? He said, do not be afraid. This is good news. Remember I asked you the question, do you ever feel like you're in persecution and you just want to say, God, are you there? This is good news. Do not be afraid. This is good news. What is the good news? That Jesus is the first and the last, the living in one. He was dead and behold, he's alive forevermore. And he has the keys of death and Hades. What does that mean, the keys of death and Hades? Well, the keys of death and Hades simply means that Jesus has... Victory over death. We say sometimes death, burial, and the grave. Now, we don't have time to get into it because it could take us theologically into a very long conversation. But I'm going to try in a few seconds to put it this way. Hades of this time, Hades or Sheol, depending on whether you're looking at the Greek or the Hebrew, this was a place of the dead. All right? And Jesus is saying, it, it could be, the, it could be uh, argued that it was a, a place where the soul went, the spirit went, your soul went before Jesus was resurrected. It could be, uh, there's a lot of arguments, and like I said, I'm not going to get into it, I almost did. I'm not going to get into the arguments as to what it could be. But here's what I want you to see him saying here. What Jesus is saying here is, I've got the keys to free you. What do keys do? Well, when we're bonded, when we're, when, we're, when we're in prison, right? When we're in prison, they lock the door, don't they? And when they unlock the door, hopefully it means because we've been freed. It might mean because, it might be that we're going to our court hearing. I don't know. But hopefully it means we've been freed. So if I lock you up in a prison cell in the back of the church... And, and how many of you have seen our prison cell? Anybody seen it? If I lock you up in our prison cell in the back of the church, we don't really have one. Calm down. And I lock the door. Some of you are like, Phew. I was getting really scared there. Lock the door, and I keep the key. You can't get out. I think of uh, when Heather and I take the kids to Disney World, and we go on the Pirates of the Caribbean. If you've ever been on there, there's the scene towards the end of the pirate ride where the dog is, is out there holding the keys in his mouth, and the prisoners, the pirates that are locked in prison are trying to... Get him to come over there so they can get the keys out. Jesus shows up and he says, I have the keys that will free you from death and Hades. That's, see that, see that, see, see that y'all aren't overwhelmed at all. There's no overwhelmingness over there at this church. Everybody's just like, oh yeah, that's right. Praise Jesus. But he does. He says, I have the keys that will free you. See, believers will be freed from eternal death and eternal damnation in hell. And he's saying, I have, Jesus, the keys to free you from that prison. That is beautiful. That is exciting. That is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he confirms it here in Revelation when he gives the vision to John. And because Jesus holds the keys in Hades, to death in Hades, 
He can and will restore the dead in Christ. He will restore the dead in Christ to a beautiful, glorified state of all eternity. You who have pain in your bodies, the pain will not last forever. Praise God. You who have pain in your minds, you have mental disabilities or mental issues, those mental issues will not last forever. Praise God. You who have physical ailments or physical disabilities or learning disabilities or learning ailments or sight disabilities or sight ailments or hearing disabilities or whatever you have that isn't good, it will not last forever. I mean, come on. Is that not good news? It's almost like if this was a, a, a an infomercial, you know, people be people get more excited about selling Tupperware than they do about Jesus Christ. You can get five gallons of Tupperware for the price of one if you act now. Can I tell you something? If you act now, you can be guaranteed that you will have the keys given to you to unlock your soul from death, burial, and the grave. <laughs> That's that ought to get you excited. I hope some of y'all become Pentecostal before you come back. That ought to get, get the Holy Spirit going in some of y'all. I don't know. Just kidding all our Pentecostal friends out there. Some apply, I, 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 some apply, some apply the term angels here. Let's look at this real quick, wrapping up. Therefore, write these things you've seen and the things that are and the things that which will take place after these. For the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars of the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now some apply angels to be messengers or prophetic messengers. Some apply those to be those that have read the message in their congregations at the time of uh, then and now. And some apply these term angels to simply be the bishops of local communities. Where we're going to fall on this is simply this. Let me say that again so you can get it if you're writing it down. Prophetic messengers, those that read the message in their congregations, or even the bishops of local communities. Now, where we're going with this and where we're going to lean on, and you can lean on wherever you want to believe, you might say it's prophetic messengers. You might say it's simply those that read the message in their congregations. Or you might say it's bishops of local communities. What we're going to do is we're going to take the literal word and it's translated as messenger. So the literal word for angel is translated in this sense, in this Greek, for messenger. So whatever matters, whatever doesn't matter, this is what does. And it is that that is a messenger. Maybe it's a real angel, maybe it's not. But it's a messenger who's delivering the truth contained in the vision of John, known as the revelation of Jesus Christ. All right, are we clear on that? If we are, say amen. All right, so do you remember at the beginning when I said this? Have you ever felt as if your suffering was unknown to God? Well, folks, we all have been there. But John's vision, and we're going to get into the church of Ephesus next week. John's vision of all of this and all the messages given to the seven churches and all of the prophetic vision given about the end times is for comfort and for encouragement. It's to say that for those who are in Jesus Christ, in other words, that's fancy church talk for saying, for those who believe in Jesus. And let me just say, we make believing in Jesus too hard as, as Christians. We think you gotta do, you gotta come down front, you gotta pray a prayer, you gotta really believe, we gotta inspect you for a little while, we gotta make sure you, listen to me. <laughs> if I walked up to you and I said, do you believe, we got any kids in here? Alright. If I walked up to you and I said, do you believe in Santa Claus? And you said, no. I would try to convince you that Santa's real. If you said, yes, I believe in Santa Claus, some of y'all like, I know adults who go, well, I believe in the, the magic of Santa. There ain't no magic, he ain't never paid my bill. Our kids are beneficiaries of Santa Claus over the years, and there's no, there's no magic in that bill getting paid. My wife and I have paid the bill. When I say my wife and I, I mean I have. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> just, just tease him. Just tease him. Um, but seriously, if I came up and asked you that question and said, do you believe in Santa? And you said yes, I might think you're crazy, but I would take your word for it. Why are we not doing that with people when they say they believe in Jesus? Well, I'll tell you why. Because we are afraid that we're going to celebrate their salvation and find out it's not true. Let me tell you something. That happens all too often, and I don't like it when that happens. But let me just be very clear about something. You and I did not die on the cross for them to go to heaven. We are here to give them the message of Jesus Christ. We didn't die on the cross for them. We're here to tell them about Jesus. 
So if Santa were real, okay, and we our job was to tell people about Santa Claus, or to use a better illustration, let's just do this. Wrap up with this thought. Say you work in a store and your job is public relations and marketing for the store. And you guys have a BOGO sale going on, a buy one, get one sale coming up on Saturday. And your job, your manager says, is to get the word out about this sale. What are you going to do? You're going to PR like a maniac. You're going to go tell everybody you can. I'll give you another example. I just came to me, my God in heaven. Hallelujah. Let me ask you this. How many of you got the text message, the email, or the Facebook message? Show of hands. How many of you got that message about us doing the car driving thing at United Way yesterday? Raise your hand if you got that. All right. A lot of people got that. All right. If you didn't, sign up for the text messages. Fill out your phone number and your connection card and tell us you want text message updates because I sent a slew of them out. All right. So uh, as some of you probably go, oh, it's him again. Um, now, how many of you uh, went out and did it yesterday? Whoa, 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 whoa. I know. How many of you? One? Really? Over 300 did, but not from here. here. (laughs) Two. Two. Okay. Well, I don't know what you had going on yesterday, so I'm going to leave it at that. But let me just say this. My job was to get out and push it and put it into public relations mode. So I got out and I PR'd it. I pushed it and I pushed it and I pushed it. Now, whether you did it or not, eh, but I pushed it and I pushed it and I pushed it. All right? As much as I pushed that yesterday, my job is to push Jesus, not on somebody, but push the gospel into the world. Let as many people know about Jesus as humanly possible. Some people say, why are you all over social media? Why do we stream? Hey, we got another person streaming last week from Missouri. From Naylor, Missouri, over in that area, a little town in Missouri, they contacted us, sent a message, said that they were listening and they enjoyed the sermon. That is reaching, this is reaching across the world, across the globe. Why? Because Jesus is, we need to make much of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is worth making much of. The gospel is more important than anything we can do. And we're all called as PR people to go out and share the gospel. And so I say all that because of this. In sharing the gospel, in telling somebody about Jesus, and in them getting saved or giving their life to Jesus and trusting Him, sometimes all we really need to ask at that moment is, do you believe that Jesus died for your sins, rose again, and is the only way to heaven? If you believe that, if you... Now, y'all, some people will say, I believe it, preacher, and they don't really believe it. We'll find out as time goes on. But if you really believe that, and you confess that need for Him as your Lord and Savior, which is what you just did when you said yes, the Bible says you're saved. The Bible does not say you have to live perfectly, be a certain way, act like this, look like... You know who says that we have to do that? The church. And that's why the church is a whole. And that's why so many people are turned off of the idea of being a Christian or being in a local church because the church has slapped on all of these judgments and criteria. I had a young person say to me today, and I don't want to embarrass that person, but I had a young person say to me today, he saw my tie stuff and he said, I, I didn't know how to dress for church. I said, you, you're perfect. Let me tell you how you dress for church. This is how you dress for church. You ready? You dress modestly. That's how you dress for church. In other words, we don't want you coming up here with everything hanging out. All right? If you got that, those shorts where we can tell your butt's hanging out, no, that's not appropriate. You shouldn't be wearing that anywhere, much less at church. We don't want you. Some of y'all go to the beach and what you wear at the beach, we don't want you wearing it at church. All right? But whether it's a suit, tie, t-shirt, jeans, shorts, pants, whatever, as long as it's appropriate, modestly, as long as it's modest. Some of y'all are in your seats going, Mm-mm, you can't dress like that. You can't wear shorts to church. Show me where it says that. Well, I'm supposed to put on my Sunday best for Jesus. Show me where it says that. Show me where it says that. I'll show you where it says that in Samuel, that first Samuel, that God is concerned with the heart and the inner man and man is concerned with the outer image. I'll show you that. Show me where it's contradicted. Now, what I mean by that is this. In a world of persecution, in a world of problems, in a world of of judgment, unfair judgment, what's our role? Our role is to take John's vision, the whole gospel message, Matthew, Mark, Luke, parts of the book of John, and then when people are struggling, point them to John's vision. Because John's vision was given to confirm what the gospels are teaching. 
It was, listen to that again, John's vision, revelation was given to confirm what the Gospels teach. And that is that he came, he died, he rose again, and he's coming back in a thunderous glory to rescue his believers. (laughs) There's good news in Jesus. There's good news in Jesus. If you bear the light of Jesus, there's good news. If you don't, to be quite honest, there's bad news for you. I couldn't say it any other way and be honest and not be honest about it. But if you are a bearer of the light, if you are one who follows Jesus, if you believe in him and, if, and, 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 and it's just a simple faith, if you have that faith in Jesus Christ, you don't have to be perfect, you don't have to have all the answers, you just have to believe in Jesus. And if you believe in Jesus, his grace is sufficient. And your gift of salvation, the gift of salvation is yours. And no matter what you experience on this earth, Miss Sydney, you come on forward, please. No matter what you experience on this earth, no matter what hell comes your way on earth, you can know for sure you will not go hell's way in eternity. That's the good news. So none of you went out and, uh, and test drove yesterday. Well, the good news about it is Jesus is still on the throne. <laughs> God is a good God no matter what. Let me tell you something. Don't come up to me after church. Don't come up to me after church and give me excuses. I'm not your judge. I'm not upset. That's just life. I'm not. Please don't, okay? Don't come up and say, well, I was so busy. I'm not not mad. I'm not upset. I'm not disappointed. I'm not discouraged. I was surprised. (laughs) But I'm not any of those other things. Of course, I ask that question because I like to give the report. I'm not going to put that on Facebook. But here's the thing. We serve an awesome God. We serve an awesome Jesus. We serve a risen Savior. And if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this may not make a whole lot of sense, but I'm going to tell you we can make it really easy because Jesus made it easy for you. He took on all the pain, the suffering, and the punishment, and the God's wrath so that he could make it easy for you. You just got to trust in him, believe in him, ask him to forgive you, and you're good. You got to repent of those sins, and you are done. You are good. You are in with God. And if it's real, your belief is real, you will see a change in your life. If it's not real, you won't. But if it is real, you will see a change in your life. Will you stand with me, please? And I'm going to open up this altar, and I'm going to ask you to do this. If you feel like you need to come down and have a word of prayer about anything, please come down. The altar is open, as always, for you to come down and pray. If you would like somebody to pray with you about Jesus and knowing Him as your Lord and Savior... Do that because you walk out that door, God forbid, you get in a wreck and you die, your time is up. I'm not trying to scare you, I just want you to recognize if God's calling your heart today to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, follow God's calling and answer it because you don't know. God's calling might be saying, I know when your time is up, your time is up tomorrow, get saved today. We don't know that. You may live another 20, 30, 40 years. But God knows and God's calling based upon his knowledge. So I want to ask you to respond to the gospel if, in fact, God's calling you to do so. Otherwise, the altar's open. Come and pray, and we'll be dismissed in just a moment.